Assalamu alaikum students. So today we start a uh, rather tricky topic of cardiac output. And uh, during the course of these lectures, uh, I will be explaining what I mean by the word tricky. Uh, it's, uh, it brings together these two highly complex uh, uh, components of the CVS, i.e. the heart and the circulation out of which these two lectures, the first two are very linked. It has, uh, we will define cardiac output, uh, we'll look at its values. And then the mainstay, the main focus of this discussion today is the factors affecting it or regulating it. What is cardiac output, quote unquote, made of? What is cardiac output? Cardiac output basically is the quantity of blood pumped by each ventricle per unit time which is conventionally per, per minute. Okay, so uh, in, in, in males, it's around 5.6. You, you can remember five liters per minute, generally speaking. But if you, uh, if you want to be specific, this is the value in males and 4.9 per liters per minute in females on an average. This does vary in the normal uh, um, uh, range. It, there is a variance, uh, so that's that. A common mistake, of students, a very, very silly mistake of students uh, that they make when they are asked to define cardiac output is they mention the silliest of definitions by saying quantity of blood pumped by the left ventricle into the aorta. Okay. Now, if you understand, if you have the basic knowledge about the cardiovascular system as being one, you should have the sense to understand that the left side of the heart the blood that is coming in the left side of the heart is actually coming from the right side of the heart. Okay, so if the right side of the heart does not push five liters in a minute, where will you get the five liters uh, per minute from the left heart? Right, because they are in series. Okay, uh, so basically both ventricles uh, per unit time pump the same amount of blood because it's just one series. It's one common thing, <clears throat> something that is missed. Uh, in a in a in a why why and you just uh, cram the, these definitions from one book or the other and hence uh, the examiner has a has a heyday with you guys so it's each ventricle all right um, however there are situations where both of the cardiac outputs right and left may vary so some pathology in the left ventricle so for example an mi okay myocardial infarction in the left side of the heart in the left ventricle specifically may cause it to decrease its contractile uh, performance and hence it it won't it, it does is it, it isn't uh, uh, its output is not enough in this particular scenario so blood starts to accumulate where in the lungs because left ventricle is not quote unquote clearing the blood from the lung and pushing it into the aorta in this case the right side of the heart will do its job so that's cardiac output i.e the blood pumped by the right ventricle per minute or whatever unit of time you're taking usually it's per minute will be will be normal in this situation because right heart is fine it's the left heart that is the problem now you can understand that the right heart is pumping normal blood into the lungs while the left heart is not clearing it out because it's weak okay so where will the blood starts to accumulate in the lungs you will have pulmonary conge congestion and this is a serious issue okay uh, so in this case cardiac output will differ what about and let's take another scenario if the right ventricle uh, develops an issue which interferes with this contraction and uh, left ventricle is uh, fine then you'll have pooling of blood in the periphery i.e in the veins and in the tissues because right side is not clearing blood it, the blood is coming via venous return into it, but it's not contracting properly. So there will be congestion on the in the circulation side where right uh, uh, right ventricle is supposed to clear the blood from circulation and pump it into the lungs. Okay. So again, congestion is the word is the key word. So basically, this leads to congestive cardiac failure. These scenarios where an anomaly or a disease occurred inside a ventricle which caused its contractility to decrease and pooling of blood started to happen behind it for, for left ventricle behind means in the lungs and for right ventricle behind means in the tissue in the peripheral tissues 
this caused a congestive picture we call it congest and and if if this is not relieved the patient uh, goes into congestive cardiac failure the heart fails to do its job leading to congestion congestive cardiac failure ccf so this is a definition and some 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 clinical stuff to think about uh, cardiac index is uh, is a very useful um, uh, a use, a useful concept uh, useful statistic in the sense that it basically divides the cardiac output according to the surface area of the person okay so in in, a, in an average person uh, the range is 2.6 to 4.2 liters per minute per meter square average being 3.2 okay so this is an interesting thing the maximum value is at age 10 around age 10 and then it starts to decrease okay so at at age 10 you have cardiac output uh, surface area ratio maximum uh, heart is new body is small so the ratio is beautiful it's uh, it's uh, it's very very mathematically sound but as the size increases obviously the uh, the, the heart uh, uh, will will have to increase its performance uh, then gradually decreases during adolescence and adulthood and when you hit old age it it, it dips down further uh, this is an important stat as well if the cardiac index falls below 1.8 the person is labeled as having cardiogenic shock uh, you will be uh, yes in the at the end of this uh, this whole uh, circulation we'll be discussing what shock is shock is an inadequacy of circulation to maintain blood flow to the tissues and if it's cardio if there are many many types uh, if it's uh, the type is cardiogenic it means that the heart is the is the culprit uh, in failing the circulation uh, of its obligations to uh, fulfill blood flows to various organs. This is that master slide which basically talks about uh, factors affecting or 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 factors regulating uh, cardiac output. We'll go, go nice and slow on this. So he, he, he's mentioned it's actually a very nice diagram, a flowchart. Um, it basically divides cardiac output, the, the factors uh, that affect cardiac output or constitute cardiac output into two. One is stroke volume and the other is heart rate. Okay. Most of the heart rate stuff and the stroke volume stuff you should have uh, discussed or, or uh, studied under heart physiology when you were discussing cardiac cycle. Uh, in cardiac cycle right after that there's a discussion in Guyton uh, uh, where he talks about stroke volume he defines stroke volume uh, uh, discusses Frank Starling law and this that the other and then heart rate right at the end of that chapter he discusses heart rate effect of sympathetics and parasympathetics on the heart rate and that that sort of thing this is basically that however we basically will be discussing it uh, together and uh, I'll be discussing some additional factors right here uh, in a bit, okay? So basically, as I have labeled it here, cardiac factors, this flow chart is cardiac factors. The, the cardiac factors that affect cardiac output. And then as I mentioned, there are circulatory factors that affect cardiac output. And then there are some conceptual overlapping factors which affect cardiac output. So if you get an SEQ, which uh, asks you to to comment or give a summary or whatever adjective that they use uh, to describe how cardiac output gets uh, regulated or the factors affecting cardiac output basically these are the three headings that i would like you to use in that in that discussion number one cardiac factors number two circulatory factors number three coupling factors okay we start with cardiac factors so basically uh, the main two uh, characters are stroke volume and heart rate. We'll start with stroke volume. Stroke volume, what is stroke volume? Stroke volume is the amount of blood uh, that a ventricle ejects per beat. Remember, this also is one of the common mistakes. Cardiac output is a per time amount of blood pumped by each ventricle per unit of time, right? What is stroke volume? Stroke volume is the amount of blood pumped by each ventricle per beat. When we talk about beat, naturally, we are talking about contraction. Beat is contraction. So the, its, its stroke volume will be determined by how 
hard it can contract the Frank Starling law that becomes operational here basically is influenced by two uh, is end diastolic volume I'll dilate on it in a bit the second is contractility okay so for a, for the moment I would like you to concentrate on these two EDV and diastolic volume is basically the amount of blood that is collected in the ventricle just before it goes into systole. In other way, whatever in during diastole, whatever amount of blood that is accumulated inside a ventricle is its end diastolic volume, i.e. at the end of diastole, whatever volume is collected here. Okay. The perceptive student will immediately link this with preload. This is preload. Uh, how do you get preload? To become end diastolic volume venous return so you will find that venous return preload uh, can be used interchangeably okay venous return is a physical term preload is a concept okay and both basically are linked with end diastolic volume because this is what they eventually become okay they become end diastolic volume so right this is that section which I discussed with you just now. This is the Frank starting relationship. So the more EDV, the more force of contraction. I hope this is clear. Uh, and contractility. What is contractility? What is the difference between force of contraction and contractility? Contractility is what you saw uh, uh, the behavior of the myocardium in the presence of catecholamines. So for each degree of stretch, in the absence of a catecholamine can get you so much of the force of contraction can get you a normal stroke volume but in the presence of catecholamines the same amount of stretch will increase the stroke volume this ability of the myocardium to 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 increase its its contractile profile in the presence of sympathetic stimulation is referred to as contractility in physiology, we don't use, especially in heart physiology, we don't use this term uh, casually. Contractility has a specific meaning. In the absence of catecholamines, it's simple EDV uh, uh, fetching you the normal stroke volume. I hope you, uh, uh, you, you understood that subtlety. Okay. Now, this bit we'll stop here for a bit. Let's explore what he says for EDV. EDV varies with venous return. I've, I've, I've discussed this uh, already with you. And uh, venous return is the determinant, is the, uh, the end, uh, the EDV is the end point of re venous return. If you increase venous return, you increase EDV. You decrease venous return, you decrease EDV. So this is easy peasy and it's a venous return as we'll discuss. Uh, we, uh, uh, but we'll also touch upon it in the ancillary factors in a bit. So uh, it's, it's basically uh, the peripheral pumps uh, in the in the lower limbs then the abdominal pump and the thoracic abdominal pump all of this aids venous return which then becomes edv which then becomes uh, the main thrust behind the force of contraction which determines stroke volume okay so the nice back channel thing that we just did here um, and let's now go on to the heart rate heart rate is the second parameter a more simpler one it's simply the number of times that the heart is contracting mind you if you really remember your cardiac physiology even increasing the heart rate will eventually increase the contractility now I want you to work it out increase heart rate will eventually increase the individual contraction uh, strength of each uh, contraction so increasing heart rate is determined by again the rhythmicity uh, uh, it increases with sympathetic innovation it decreases by parasympathetic innervation. This is uh, pretty much straightforward. Uh, you want to revise it, you can revise that section of the heart physiology, okay? Now, sympathetics are interesting in the sense that on one side, they enhance cardiac output by increasing heart rate. Remember, cardiac output is equal to stroke volume multiplied by heart rate. So sympathetics are nicely uh, sitting in the middle. They are enhancing heart rate so they enhance cardiac output by enhancing heart rate and they enhance stroke volume. How? Just we discussed, we just discussed contractility. By enhancing 
per stroke, every stroke, every contraction of the myocardium for its given EDV, more contractility, more forceful contraction uh, uh, happens. We call it contractility. So sympathetics increase that and add to stroke volume and hence have a dual effect on increasing uh, cardiac output through the heart rate and through the stroke volume. Okay. There's a third component. If you remember, we did mention the unstressed and the stressed volume. If you remember, I think in the baroreceptor reflex, we mentioned it, this term unstressed and stressed. Uh, we mentioned that veins under vein function as well. We mentioned that their main function is as a res to act as a reservoir of blood. Remember? So not all the time, not all blood is being circulated. Some blood is stored in veins because of their reservoirs and have large diameters. Now, if you activate sympathetic nervous system, it basically vasoconstricts veins as well, uh, pushing that unstressed volume, that stored blood uh, back into towards the heart. That enhances venous return. And you know the rest of that uh, story. You know that well now. Okay, this will add to that end diastolic volume. This happens, this happens, and this happens. Okay, this is a very nice conceptual overview. This flow chart, it's brilliant uh, to understand the cardiac factors uh, affecting cardiac output. Okay, however, this indeed is incomplete. Okay, in that diagram, let me just go back. Okay, in this diagram, what we've just discussed is just this heart. Cardiac factors are factors affecting the heart only. Okay. Stroke volume is, we've discussed this, heart rate, we've discussed this. Okay. So cardiac output is equal to stroke volume into heart rate. We've done that. However, there are other uh, considerations. What are those considerations? There, are, there is a whole, because we, we, we said that it's, it's, it's one unit. There are circulatory factors. So uh, what if, the compliance of the aorta is not as much uh, as it's supposed to be. What if it's stiffer? What, what do you think would happen? So let me go back. So what if these arteries are not flexible enough? They were flexible, but with, with age, they became stiffer. Yeah. When they became stiffer, now when you do the thing that you did with the heart, where it displaced volume from here to here, i.e. cardiac output, but now the cardiac output is being introduced in a much stiffer system. If you know what I mean, it's much stiffer now. So there will be changes. The heart will have to pump a bit extra hard to introduce this to, to achieve the same 120 by 80 blood pressure in a stiffer system. Yes. So cardiac yeah, circulation compliance, circulatory uh, compliance basically matters. Resistance matters. If the TPR is more, and you will do this in your tutorial as an exercise, uh, your tutorial teacher will discuss uh, uh, a graph where they increased or decreased the TPR and looked at how the cardiac output fluctuated with it. Okay, so when you just you fluctuate the TPR, uh, you have uh, changes in the cardiac output. Mind you, during that exercise, the blood pressure basically uh, needs to be constant. More on that during that tutorial. Okay. Uh, similarly, uh, blood volume, again, going back, what if the overall volume of this system was more than normal? Okay. Then obviously the cardiac output will have, will have, uh, uh, will be influenced by, by this, by this thing. Uh, remember that all of this, the cardiac factors, the circulatory factors, we'll be discussing some serious quantification of data. Uh, we'll go into detail. In the second lecture, this consider this as a nice, chunky overview of that second component of this lecture series. At the end, we are we are basically uh, uh, recapping the coupling factors. Um, th this is rather a conceptual overview of all the stuff that we have discussed uh, at the moment. So, uh, afterload basically represents everything which is going just uh, for remembering purposes, please do not write this or reproduce this. Everything which is going against the cardiac output. So all that resistance, which goes against it, which is anti cardiac output. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, aortic valve stenosis, 
if if the aortic valve is stenosed it's not properly dilated it, it's not functioning properly that we will refer to it as in conceptual terms as increased afterload if that valve is fine but the guy has hypertension so again hypertension means that chamber in which your left ventricle is to push blood in that pressure in that chamber is more so the ventricle is under pressure now to increase to generate more pressure again its work has increased cardiac work has increased because the afterload has increased okay right what about the preload preload is venous return all the blood that is now coming back uh, becoming the, the 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 load which the heart needs to carry through that is the preload okay so venous return is preload um, which then become edv we've, we've discussed this uh, uh, and just a footnote remember don't forget the main circulatory filling pressure that's the baseline of all this pressure business so we come to the end of this uh, uh, of this uh, first lecture